Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, we are gonna kind of go with a moderator less panel. So I'm just kind of gonna get all of our panelists together and we're gonna kind of make this more of a conversation and keep it going. And for those of you that are um, joining us, if you've got any questions, you can type them in the chat or I think Kelsey's got another way that you can reach um, through a different portal and she'll type them in the chat. So feel free to raise your hand or interrupt us if you've got any questions and um, we'll just kind of chat amongst ourselves and then include anything you've got questions for. So I'm going to start with my background and then we'll have our other panelists kind of give you a little bit of their background and kind of our involvement with um, philanthropic events um, throughout our career. So I'm Stephanie Jarvis. I'm currently a lecturer at um, ASU in their um, sports law and business program. I, um, at the same time, am kind of an independent contractor consultant for the various mega events that come to Arizona. Um, so in the past, I was uh, with the College Athletic Conference for 12 years, and then I moved out to Arizona to never see snow again and work for the Fiesta Bowl um, as their general counsel, but also was involved with their charitable giving and then worked for the college football playoff national championship that was here in 2016, the men's final four here in 2017, both of which gave a million dollars in philanthropic projects in the state of Arizona. And then I worked on our last um, mega event bids for the men's final four, which will be here in 2024 and the women's final four, which will be here in 2026. And then maybe Aileen can introduce herself. Oh, sure, thanks. Um, so my name's Eileen McManaman. I'm the founder and managing partner of 5T Sports Group, and we focus on triple bottom line returns in sports. We've, uh, that means economic, environmental, and social returns. Um, we work primarily in the professional sports space with leagues, teams, around their major events, um, as well as uh, working with some mega events and host cities, um, a few Olympic games, uh, FIFA Women's World Cup and other World Cup. Um, my company is based out of Vancouver, Canada, uh, and uh, we also have an office in Chicago, and we have uh, affiliate offices in Berlin, Lausanne, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, and London. And Rich? Hello, hi. How is everybody? Uh, appreciate being here and, and be able to share some ideas in the panel with these two lovely ladies. Uh, my name is Rich Stein. I have a company called Digitize Your Brand based here in uh, Southern California, Irvine area. And uh, what we're doing is actually working around some technology that uh, digitizes merchandise. Uh, so essentially we're working with events um, in the cause space and among other spaces but really trying to bring uh, digital and mobile to the table and helping amplify um, causes, movements, philanthropies, um, nonprofits. Uh, we, we do stuff, of course, for for-profit for companies, leagues and teams and entities and brands. Uh, but one of our focuses on, is something called merchandise with purpose. And the idea really is to amplify and create um, you know, exponential opportunity with merchandising inside of the uh, nonprofit and cause space. So, um, Excited to be here and to share some hopefully new ideas and new technology uh, that can be relevant not only before COVID in how we uh, manage mega events and even uh, after the events itself, uh, but there's some interesting applications we're doing right now for what we call the at-home experience, which is how are we connecting with people at home and driving engagement and uh, opportunity, uh, donations, fundraising, um, education, participation, all the cool and fun buzzwords. So I'm happy to be here. Look forward to the next 45 minutes to an hour. Great. Well, I think what we want to get started with talking about is the different types of philanthropy and legacy that are sort of associated with uh, mega events. And just to kind of let everyone know how we're going to do this, we're going to talk first about the more traditional community philanthropy. Then we're going to talk about the economic legacy. And then lastly, the sustainability and the impact of how you can make a difference um, in the environment through these mega events. So with community philanthropy, um, a lot of it is planned and I can talk a lot about that. And I think our other panelists will weigh in as well, but I can specifically talk about how these mega events, particularly in Arizona, have been able to really leave a lasting 
legacy on the community that you're in. And that's one of the things that's really important about these events, right? It's great to have all the visitors coming and we'll talk about the economic effects of that later, but it's also really important if you can point to something leaves a long lasting legacy long after the event is gone. And so some of the things that we have done um, that I've been involved with, um, with the uh, college football playoff national championship, we sort of had two big um, uh, kind of ventures that we did. And the first was to build a football field that would be able to be used by an underprivileged high school. So we really just refurbished a field. And so that was more of a facility driven um, project that is probably pretty traditional in the world of sports mega events. I think you see that a lot where Super Bowls or um, all-star games will kind of refurbish something. And that really is there long after the event has gone. But the other one that I thought was really unique um, the college football playoff has partnered. Um, they, they call it extra yard for teachers. That's their philanthropic initiative. And so what they have really decided is they want to make sure that every community that they have a playoff bowl in and, and a national championship, they really help teachers in that community. And so we gave about, I would say $700,000 to Arizona teachers. And the main way we did that was through something called donors choose which is an organization that I kind of say is like a GoFundMe for teachers. Um, teachers are able to use their platform and say, okay, I need this for my classroom. I really would like to have a garden that I build with my elementary school students. And so I need gardening supplies and gloves and dirt and all that. And they're able to say, here's exactly how much it costs. Here's the breakdown. And then individuals can just donate to that project. And so what we did, um, we, funded every single project in the state of Arizona. So every teacher's project in the state of Arizona was funded through the college football playoff national championship that we hosted. And so we were able to make sure that every teacher who had put a request in got that. And we did some fun things with it where we would go to different elementary schools or high schools and have an assembly and then surprise the teacher to let them know that their project was being funded. So we were able to use it in a way to bring about some PR for our event and some marketing for the event. But it was also a way to really put funding in the hands of our teachers um, here in Arizona. And then the other project that I think was really cool through our final four, which we did refurbish a, a basketball park, an outdoor park where some legendary Phoenix basketball players that went on to the NBA, but they were really playground legends. Um, we were able to refurbish their um, library and their gym and their basketball court. And that was another cool facility one. But we did something called Read to the Final Four where every third grader in the state of Arizona was given access to through a Mayan platform, which is just the name of a platform, but an online library where everyone, they were access, able to access millions and millions of books. And then we tracked their minutes and we had a fun contest related to the, you know, 68 teams and going down to the 32 and the 60, you know, everything. And then it culminated with when the final four was here in town, we were able to bring the students from the four top schools into our final four Friday and have a celebration of them and let them be rewarded for whoever had read the most minutes. So we turned it into a fun little competition between all the students, but it was about, I would say that was another, oh, $750,000 project that I think really made a difference here. Um, long beyond when the final four was here. So that's kind of my experience with these philanthropic events. And maybe Eileen can talk about some of her experience with that. Sure, yeah, you know, planning is is really, really key. Um, but I thought I'd, I'd share one with uh, with the group that, that was a bit more spontaneous, um, uh, you know, because I think we don't see that often, but but even even in that, you know, anyway, um, during the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympic Games, um, the uh, British uh, national team, uh, which was about 80 some athletes, uh, only ended up taking home one medal, uh, unfortunately, but, um, you know, Britain not necessarily perhaps known for their winter sport prowess as much as, let's say, Scandinavia or Canada. Uh, but they kind of made a decision. They'd had to purchase a number of things uh, to support them while they were here. Some things were, you know, uh, office equipment or lamps or things like that. And, and other things were just, you know, they had a lot of swag that they couldn't afford to take home. So they happened to phone up the uh, nonprofit that I was working with. It's a grassroots sports organization throughout Vancouver, very similar to a boys and girls clubs, except without 
without bricks and mortar facilities. They operate out of the schools. Uh, anyway, they phoned up and said, you know what, we don't want to junk this stuff. We think it can help you. I don't, I'm, we still don't know exactly how they found us, but they found us. They made that effort. Uh, and then they said, you know, we haven't had that great of a showing. It might be really kind of nice for us to be able to do this in person. Um, is it possible to put, a, put together a lunch and bring some of the kids that would be the beneficiaries of these uh, funds and, and, uh, and hand off some of the swag on our way to the airport? So we arranged that. But one of the things that I saw out of that was the two way of philanthropy. Um, you know, that team was going home with not a great deal of on track, on slope, <laughs> on ice success from those games. Um, but their lasting and last moment in uh, moments in Vancouver were spent with a group of kids that they were giving back to. So I thought that was just a really spectacular thing, even though we, we all want to plan and we'll talk a lot more about planning things. Um, sometimes the community things can be quite, uh, quite special when they're spontaneous for both parties. That's great. I think that's so true. And I think people forget about that, that the, you know, participants in a competition or in a mega event or anything like that, they, they usually want to give back. And it's just a nice touch. I, when I've been involved with the Fiesta Bowl, that's one of the things that they do with the players that come in every year, not this year because of COVID, but in most years, they're able to do some things where they go shopping for Christmas gifts with kids, or they have a youth clinic, or they go bowling, or they go to, um, one of those places here that's like uh, the trampolines and the different, you know, arcade kind of things. Mm -hmm. And they light up when they do that. And so I think it's, it's amazing for mm -hmm. the kids, but it's also really amazing for the participants in the competition. And I think people forget about that. And you're right. The spontaneous stuff is, doesn't always get covered, but it's, I think just as important as the planned giving. Yeah, and what, what that's done now is create for us a new best practice in the toolkit that while we might not have access to, to the participants um, in advance of them coming in, we can say, hey, we can start to make those calls in that last week or so as they're getting ready to clear out. Um, in the case of, again, like a um, FIFA is a little bit more mobile, but certainly Olympic Games, Pan Am Games, things like this, where they're in a fixed place where they, they have accumulated this stuff to say, hey, you know, here's a few ways you can connect with the local community. I know rugby doesn't ever they go, even though they're on a circuit and going from place to place and it's very hectic. Um, they're quite good about reaching out and connecting uh, each national team that's come in with, with a school. Awesome. Rich, do you have anything, any thoughts on the community philanthropy part of it before we move to economic and sustainability? No, just, I mean, just other than, uh, yeah, just a, a gap that, that we see that, um, you know, can provide more value as it relates to, um, you mentioned that the swag that was left behind and from a, a sustainability perspective, uh, sometimes that happens quite often and it's, you know, what do you do with it? How do you, how do you leverage it? And that was a really good example of, of like you said, the uh, participants maybe didn't have the success they wanted, but um, definitely having them, you know, uh, still use that, leverage that to a certain part of the community. Um, and then they probably felt a lot better getting on that plane uh, than they did, you know, uh, maybe not doing so well in the yeah. competition. So, and they probably did as much for them in, in terms of making them feel good about everything than it did for the, the recipients. So that's, that's really cool. Awesome. Well, moving on to kind of the economic legacy, um, I, I think, you know, you do hear some big numbers, right? And some of those numbers are often um, disputed, but I do think it's important that these events do leave an economic legacy, whether it's tax dollars, hotel dollars, there are certain things that, um, mega events do one of the things i can talk about is infrastructure i think people maybe forget if you've got a super bowl coming to town you know one of the things that happened here in arizona after the super bowl uh, we had huge amounts of building happening downtown i mean downtown before the super bowl came to arizona i don't know if anyone's been to phoenix but i would say pre-2015 is very different than downtown phoenix now and while it's wonderful it also makes me nuts when i'm driving through it and there's a construction zone for a new building going up everywhere but um you can really tell the, the difference between the pre-super bowl downtown and the post-super bowl but even light rail i mean we always joke when i we, I've been lucky enough to host um, a Final Four 
after the Super Bowl and we will do the exact same thing in 23. We'll have the Super Bowl here and then we have the 24 final four. And the NCAA is always so happy to go after the fin- the Super Bowl because all these things will have been done for the Super Bowl. Roads will have been changed. Highway things will have been done. Light rail will be extended. Um, building upgrades, video boards, scoreboards, all of these things that happen from having these mega events really leave a lasting impact on the community. I mean, the light rail alone, you know, yes, it's used while people are here for the Super Bowl and for the final four, but then it's here. And I'm sure with Olympics, you know, sometimes Mm -hmm. some places, maybe it's not as great, but other places you've got these great new buildings and great new facilities that are there because of these mega events. So if either of you can talk a little bit about your experience or kind of your thoughts on the economic impact of these events suffering from joint pain right now. I'll defer to you first, Rich. <laughs> well, I, I look at it as, um, you know, especially now as we move forward, um, you know, the, the impact uh, in the economy of, of, of these events, you know, not only like you're talking about the infrastructure, but the ability to extend um, uh, the value of, of that event and, and maintain the momentum and, and, and continue the momentum. So uh, what's interesting about something we're, we're working with is really helping um, the event itself amplify uh, and maximize um, anything spent on uh, print materials, uh, merchandising, uh, sponsorship activations, not only uh, at, at the event itself, but post-event. Um, we work with a technology called NFC technology, which is like Apple Pay. Um, if anyone's familiar with that, where you basically take your phone and you can tap the point of sale and it's basically facilitated a transaction. Uh, that same technology, Apple has adopted it fully and it's an Android devices and it allows you to literally tap signage, um, print materials and actually swag merchandise. And uh, we know at these, these events, of course, you know, a lot of money is spent on that uh, with not a lot of necessarily tangible return on investment or tracking uh, in a good way, uh, data capture and then um, continue momentum. So one thing we're working um, on large events and smaller events um, is really around how to leverage this technology. Um, And now everybody has a phone in their pocket that can literally engage with their physical uh, area around them. And so we're seeing not only from a payment perspective, but also from an access perspective, ticketing as as going to mobile. And now from a merchandising and um, activation and and print perspective. And now, especially with COVID, uh, we're finding a lot of contactless tools are, are needed to again, kind of create those safety and best practice measures. So what's interesting, all, I know we're all kind of huddled down now because there's not a lot happening, uh, but when, when events pop back up, uh, you know, sustainability of, of money spent is gonna be that much more uh, uh, impactful and relevant to be able to track that. Um, and then also the ability to amplify that money that was spent in, in different forms. And so, um, you know, I'm looking forward to, again, again as we all get back in, into the world, uh, but there's gonna be some interesting, um, resources and tools with, with this technology that we're looking forward to talking with some people about, uh, but really educating them, you know, it's, there's different ways to use it. It's very flexible, uh, can serve a lot of purposes, but you talk about uh, economic um, amplification, um, especially now, again, you know, when we do spend money, it needs to do more for us than uh, knowing we all have sat on the sidelines for about a year. Um, so we're looking forward to kind of expanding and, and, and talking more along, um, you know, what that looks like. And so we're in conversations with, you know, different leagues or teams or venues looking at, you know, what, what's next, what are we going to do to implement um, and maximize the money spent? Um, and then, of course, from a philanthropic perspective, of course, in, in the cause side of things, you know, again, how to amplify that and create um, mechanisms that are going to help, um, you know, maximize all that that's happening. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I, I think I can give a good example of economic impact and kind of show, you um, the COVID impact on it. And the best one would probably be um, the Cactus League here in Arizona, which is our spring training. And that's normally about a $700,000 economic impact. And this year we're calculating it as about $300,000 because we ended up losing, um, gosh, uh, I'd say three weeks in March and a little bit into April. Um, But, you know, that's a huge difference in our economy that we kind of count on every year um, in Arizona. And it's, it's direct economic impact, although it's not all tax revenue, but it is hotel, it's bed tax, it's spending, it's restaurants, it's everything. And I think you can see that those events really do benefit the community while they're there. It's not so much an 
you know, an impact afterwards. Although one of the things we've done in Arizona with our mega events, which I think is maybe a little bit unique, is we do something called a CEO forum, where we host uh, the governor kind of has a group called the the Zan Harrows, that was what I believe they're called. I think it means water carriers. Um, but they are a group of people that are kind of business leaders. And what they do is host uh, companies and executives from places that might want to relocate their business to Arizona or expand their current operations in Arizona. And they host them during these mega events, kind of show off our state, but they use those as an incentive. Hey, come check out Arizona while you're here to go to the Super Bowl or while you're here to go to the Final Four or the Fiesta Bowl every year. And then think about, you know, we they do presentations from local business owners and a lot of educational stuff. And, and we have been able to see some significant um, job growth and some companies really expanding into Arizona as a result of that. And that is a more permanent mm -hmm. economic impact from these mega events. And I think that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, that's, that is awesome, Stephanie, because that's, that's really, you know, these mega events, they're, they're meant to be a catalyst for the city or for the region. But, you know, if we're not careful, they can be left to be just a tour, a big tourism commercial, right. a bit of a party. Um, but then the confetti goes away. It's on the floor. It's not so pretty anymore. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and, you know, the local community that had to either step aside for things like infrastructure projects that disrupted their business or the disruption that happened to their ongoing business during the event, you know, are, are saying, wait a minute, I'm, I'm here all the time paying my taxes. Why, why didn't I get to come to this party? And why wasn't this party really about me? That's fantastic. I didn't realize it's, that um, Phoenix did that with that. I know yeah. one of the projects that we worked with and we do, we, well, we've done a few of them. We, uh, work with host cities around preparing the local business community for what that impact will be, especially when you have a long lead time in an Olympics, you typically have seven to eight years. LA is very, very lucky. <laughs> They're going to have 11 years all in, um, you know, to prepare for that. And a lot of that is that, that education about what, what's going to happen. Um, and even if you've been through it before, you've hosted a big event before, it is different each time, you know, you know, th things have changed. Obviously, it's going to be very different the next time we do. But, um, you know, what, what we'll do is do that education piece, a series of workshops with local businesses, some of whom want to be involved very integrally. You know, they'd like to do hosting things like that. They want to do um, business expansion or business attraction. We'll work with the economic developers. Um, we'll work with businesses who would like to be suppliers. We do a great deal of work around that. Um, we'll work with businesses who are just going to try to navigate the disruption. Maybe they don't have an opportunity to supply or, or leverage in any way, but we, we want to make sure that they're as healthy as they can be through the process. And then we try to, you know, work with the, the businesses as well who are like, I don't want to have any part of this, the naysayers. It's important to keep the lines of communication open because there's still going to be businesses in your community when that goes away. And they're still for the politicians going to be voters. So you want to make sure, even if they weren't happy, you've at least kept that two way communication open. We um, absolutely one do. Of the things to... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, just a really great example from, uh, and it, this one wasn't mine, but it's one of my favorite ones because they did so well with it is um, Toronto Pan Am Games in 2015 set out to make sure that they were. Um, uh, the diversity of the Pan Am Games came through by lifting up their diversity business community. So they did a program like this to reach out, to educate, um, to connect. Um, and they way overshot their goals on that. They, they were hoping for a 5 million spend out of I don't, the budget, I think was 48 million of non-infrastructure spending. Um, and they ended up at nearly eight and they ended up with twice the number of suppliers that they thought. But then that growth of those suppliers, that education and then expansion, the capacity building in those suppliers is something that, that will live on for quite a while. Well, it's, that's what I was going to bring up is one of the things that we've done is, um, and it's been required in our bids for our Women's Final Four, it was asked about during the bid process. But we sort of do a small business and a, a minority and female owned business sort of 
Some of them do it more formal where they have them all come in and they do networking, whatever, but we try really hard to lift them up and try to encourage the, besides using it as a local organizing committee, we try to say to the NFL or to the CFP or to the um, NCA, here's a list of minority and female owned businesses. And so whether it's caterers or florists or event space, all of those different things, we really try to use that as a way to kind of get, and we try to get some publicity to them too, because our local news media will cover that. So then we're able to talk about um, some events that we have coming up in the community and we can talk about the vendor that's providing the services for that. So we try, because you're right, sometimes the businesses are a little bit like, oh, people can't get to my business because you've closed the road and they're annoyed and no one wants to come downtown. You know, So we do have to try to find some little carrots for them um, to get some wins for them as well. Yeah. And actually, Rich, I like your technology for tracking because that's one of the things people can't say, you know, was this dollar that was spent by a local at this business or was it actually spent by someone who came in for the event? And I think with your with your tools, you know, people can start to do a lot more of that, even if you're just having, you know, you're giving people a promo code that says, well, when you spend in Phoenix and pay with your NFC payment, you know, uh, I, you know, you might get a surprise gift or a bonus or a digital good or um, entered into a contest for uh, some behind the scenes experience. I think I think that's a great um, blend. Yeah, it's, um, you know, amazing. And it's the evolution of this, really the adoption by Apple, which is really creating a lot of opportunity and, and possibilities because it's a pretty open architecture. So uh, integration into especially portable type events where you're going in there for a week at week or week and a half. And it's like, okay, how do we, you know, build something on the fly that, you know, is going to be there for two weeks and then, you know, not be, not be used anymore, but needs to integrate with localization of ticketing or payment or, um, or redemption, like you said, redemption and hospitality or at food and beverage. Um, and then, but at the end of the day too, to create that personalization. So now, um, you know, the, the fan or the individual attendee, whether they're local or not, um, you know, they're going to get the value that, um, you know, they're trying to trying to get from that experience. But at the end of the day, too, the data that's going to come from that is going to be really worthwhile. And, and uh, the ability to to measure that and track it and validate it um, is really what's going to be key with with this as well. So, um, yeah, interesting opportunities and possibilities. So it's, it's pretty endless for sure. Very cool. Well, moving on to sustainability, um, I think that's something that people maybe don't think about as much, but how can you make sure that this event is not, uh, first of all, negatively impacting um, the environment, you know, and sometimes you have no choice. There are certain things that obviously bringing in more cars, um, my internet connection is unstable, but hopefully I'll still stay with us. Um, but you know, how are you able to kind of green up the event? Some of the things that we've done um, with the women's final four and the men's final, I'm sorry, the men's final four college football playoff. Um, we, uh, it, it's strangely enough, all of our signage and everything that we did around the city, all of our banners and our street pole things, we actually repurposed all of them and made them into bags or other gifts so that we were able to not just throw away all of those signs. If you think of a city and what it looks like after an event. Um, so we really tried to repurpose that. For our men's final four, we were evergreen certified. So we did a lot with water. We did a lot of things um, just trying to kind of, you know, not we obviously we were not going to be a zero waste event, but some of them, you know, the, the waste management is a great example here in Phoenix. The golf tournament really tries hard. We tried as a final four, but there were some things we couldn't do, but we really tried to make it a priority. Um, and that's one of the things Eileen and I realized we know uh, one of the same people who worked on our sustainability plan for the Ben's final four. She said, you know, Colin, I was like, I know Colin. So I know I, Eileen has a lot of experience in that and she can talk about that. Yeah, a good focus of our of our businesses around around the environmental footprint, um, but it it all ties together. It all ties back to the social good of it as well. So and the economics. So again, back to the procurement. The more you're including your local businesses in whatever way you can, even having them partner up to be able to meet volumes that are required or meet timelines that are required. Um, that's you know that much less carbon and emissions that are that are um, you know, going into your, into your space, which is also a benefit for your spectators and, and the congestion and it, you know, it improves the safety around that. 
um, you know, transit, driving people towards transit. Again, with some of your solutions, Rich, that's something you wanna do, absolutely. Most people coming into a space aren't familiar with the transit system, so they're reluctant to use it, but as an organizer and as a host city, um, you know, you can get out in front of that and make it fun. You can gamify it. Um, and, and frankly, most people are quite, quite happy to be, oh, it's that easy to jump on a bus or a light rail? Oh, I had no idea. Well, this is great because now I can relax. If they're going to the waste management, they can have a few extra fears. Um, I don't know, I hear a few are consumed there, but. <laughs> just a few. But, you know, then you have things again out of big Olympics events, um, you know, uh, as you've seen on, on television, or if you've been in person, stadia and fencing are wrapped, they, miles and miles and miles of fabric wrapping to give the look and feel of the games. Happens in a lot of other places as well. Um, as it happens, Dow, who's a top Olympic sponsor, usually supplies that wrap. And a lot of it gets repurposed, um, especially in Brazil, a great deal of it got repurposed as, as shading over schoolyards and in shading in public parks. Um, and then you've got a lot of people who are upcycling uh, banners and flags and things like that, which make a really fantastic souvenir and, and are very sought after by people who are local and we're, we're very proud of hosting that event, you know, whatever it is, tote bags or any, you know, backpacks, any number of things. Um, but we see a lot of that and, and there's just the appetite for it just grows and grows and grows. Um, that's a demand now. And, and in fact, the IOC has come out with a very, very aggressive agenda. Um, but they're not only telling people what they need to do, they're providing them with the solutions and helping them network with peers. Um, so we're, gonna, we're just gonna see more and more of it. But at the end of the day, that's an efficiency thing. Um, it's not really about hugging trees or <laughs> as much as it is about, wow, how can we just waste less? You know? We've all been to these events. We see what the dumpsters in the back of house looks like afterward. It can be kind of horrific. But, um, I think all in all, it's just gotten better and better. Absolutely. And I think Rick tech, Rich Technology is going to play a huge role in that. Yeah, I mean, for years, yeah, you've seen, you know, sustainability and, you know, what does that mean? It can mean a lot of different things. And, you know, the definition evolves as, as we evolve as people and, and the impact and the uh, importance of it is, is major. And the ability, again, to not to be the technology geek here, but <laughs> to, uh, to leverage technology in a number of ways to, again, amplify the value of, of that resource spent. And as we talk about, you know, print um, and signage, uh, not only, you know, again, the reality is, of course, you know, we need all that to, um, you know, create the culture and the environment of, of that of that event, and it helps amplify sponsors and all these things. But, you know, where, where can we pack in more value to what that is? And of course, not only from a, a green perspective in terms of the procurement and, and um, construction of that, uh, but again, the util utilization of it. Um, so that's where, you know, in, embedding uh, that with technology in, in different forms can again drive and um, continue to um, you know provide value now for the whole ecosystem right and ultimately for who you're really serving which are the fans and the attendees um, and if like you said if even from a um, transportation perspective if you're you know creating more of a, a driving the behavior of, of what you want them to do and it's you know on their mobile phone uh, that much more value and opportunity um, you know and then also the ability to sustain uh, the value of that experience because um you know, as they're connecting and interacting and, and, and driving experiential, again, that's going to create data. That's going to create more value for the um, the event itself, and then you know, associated sponsors. Um, and then also, you know, again, as you know, the world I come from is is around the merchandise space. So a lot of it is the swag. And one thing, being in that space for 15 years, which is one of the reasons I started this about five years ago, was if I have to sell another pen, I'm going to put it through my head because people just throw it out. There's no value there. It's just a commodity. It's just, you know, something to give away. There's no cost benefit to it necessarily. So the ability now to literally, whether it's tote bags or, um, you know, the other merchandise and materials to embed technology um, and create sustainability, uh, not only for potential function at the event, you know, you want to carry your stuff around, but as you leave and you bring it home, it doesn't, it's just not something you're going to throw in the backyard or the dog's going to eat. It's, you know, there's potential opportunity for that to create value and sustain, if you will, um, the event experience and drive value for, um, you know, if it was a sponsor or, or the event producer. Um, so yeah, a lot of, lot of uh, interesting ways from a sustainability perspective where technology 
um, can play a role in, in, in a pre-event, at event, post event, large event, small event, um, you know, gonna be a lot of uh, interesting possibilities, let alone, of course, the, the payment mechanism and the access of not needing physical tickets anymore, which saves a ton on paper um, by having it all mobile ticketing, uh, even uh, getting rid of money um, and having the mobile wallet um, and not only that, that, that will help increase economic because it's easier to pay. Talk about the waste, waste management event. You know, you don't know how many beers you have because you just you go on there tapping in to the, uh, to payment. We know a lot of vendors in, and merchandiser at these large events are like, well, how do we get people to, you know, pay faster, quicker, more efficiently? Well, you do it with your phone. You don't have to pull anything out of your wallet. You don't have to give change. It's just automatically integrated into it. And now the commerce can go up five or 10% just because of the use of mobile payment. Uh, so, you know, huge, huge possibility there as well. Well, and that leads me and you, you brought up something that I wanted to talk about next is sort of how do you bring the philanthropy, philanthropy back with you? How do you grow it? How do you make it a little bit larger of an impact than what happens at the actual event? One example I'll give, and then I'm going to turn it over to Rich, because I think he's got some really cool ideas in this area and some really great things to kind of talk about. But one of the things that we did with a college football playoff and the donors choose, which I mentioned for the teachers, was every single person who attended the game, which was about 70,000 people, was given a gift card for $25 to spend at the donors choose. They could pick any project that they wanted, and every single person got one that attended the game. And then what that did was then hopefully they went home and they maybe said, we'll do something in Ohio or we'll do something in Clemson, wherever it might be. And also maybe, you know, we'll go above the $25, right? We'll do, we'll tack on a little bit of our own thing, or they'll tell their friends, wow, I did this really cool project. And I think you guys could, you know, it's, it's easy. Just go to this website. So that's one of the things that we tried to do to leave an impact beyond, um, just while they were here in Arizona, that was an initiative from the college football playoff national office, but I thought it was something really cool. And then Rich, I would be interested to hear some of the things that you guys have done with that. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, so when we kind of came up with our, our concept in the nonprofit cause space, it was again, you know, most people do merchandise and it's a ah, merchandise giveaways, fun stuff. Like we wanted to be more pur purposeful with what this merchandise can do. And then integration into donations and payments and, um, you know, as well as education and participation. So what we're trying to do on that on that side you know, is really to amplify um, how one person can become an influencer. And there's nothing more powerful today than our mobile devices, right? We're on it 19, 20 hours a day. It's always with us. Um, and it's a, it's a major tool, of course. Um, but now the opportunity to literally... Uh, have merchandise drive purpose on someone's phone has never been more relevant today. So we talk about, you know, really in, in any cause related or philanthropic um, uh, endeavor, it's always really about three things. One is education, meaning I don't know much about it. You know, how do I get educated? Well, we can drive a ton of education on someone's phone. It might be, I know about it, but I may not have money, but I have my time. How do I participate? Um, and I want to participate. I want to get involved. And number three, of course, is how do I give? How can I do donations? So one thing we've, we've been creating really are these wearable wristbands, just to give you an example here. And we talk about, so we've done this for uh, Susan G. Komen. We did this for an event for uh, Tony Robbins uh, with Operation Underground Railroad, which is an anti-sex trafficking um, uh, nonprofit out of uh, Utah. And the idea is you know, we go to these events and we get a piece of merchandise and we wear it, but, you know, how do I amplify that? And with this technology, literally, you can tap it with your phone and now you can drive that context on your phone. So I'll just show you real quick here. So we're doing this right now for the San Francisco 49ers and they have a solution here where you tap the wristband and literally on your phone will drive you to that call to action. So now as an individual, we used to all know, of course, the Lance Armstrong wristband and you'd see it everywhere, you know what it was, but it was kind of limited to that. Whereas now, as you have that wearable or you have that, uh, that piece of merchandise, literally me as an individual can drive the story to my network of people, friends, family, neighbors, coworkers. Um, I was at Starbucks wearing uh, this wristband and it's basically a wristband that says tap into love and it's all about social justice. Um, and the Starbucks barista loved it. And she's like, what is that? Those are really cool. And you tap it and it brings you to education about all the social uh, mm -hmm. justice movements that are happening right now. Literally now I can become an amplifier and really deliver that on somebody's phone. They may take it and do nothing with it, 
but me as an individual, I was empowered to take that merchandise, right, and drive um, activation and activity. We have kind of a saying here, it's called wear it and share it. And so I have a, a t-shirt here where I wear it and then I can share it. So someone could tap my wrist, my uh, lapel here, they can tap here, wherever that might be. And now literally I'm sharing it on their phone um, and driving, you know, whatever the cause might be. And now you're getting the amplification of, of that. And by the way, this is integrated into payment. But now it's like, oh, I, you know, how do I get involved? What can I do? It's like, well, you can give $5 right now, tap this right now. And it's within Apple Pay for you to give $5. And the ability to do that in merchandise, print materials, signage um, with this technology is amazing. And so that's something that's, that's pretty dear to us is, um, you know, working, whether it's a mega event or other types of events, but to, to, to get on your last thought there is really the ability to create sustainability for it. Now I leave and you have, you know, everyone disperses back to their hometown. Uh, but now whatever merch I may have got has now become the opportunity for me to drive action on someone's phone. And you're hearing a lot about that now with the activism is like, okay, we all know there's issues, but how do we drive engagement? How do we drive activism? How do we uh, empower people to become, you know, a voice on their own? And that's what this type of stuff can do. Um, and then of course, you know, the data behind it, the value, the ability to, to track it and um, monetize it, you know, there's, there's a, a ton of possibilities there as well, but um, you yeah, appreciate the opportunity to kind of share what that is. Cause it's, it's very under the radar. Uh, but now there's just a ton of, of opportunity, you know, um, you know, as we're out there in, in all sorts of events. So it's, it's uh, very versatile in terms of how it can be used. It's really cool. <laughs> it's awesome. I'm going to switch it up a little bit now. And I know we're in the fundraising track. So I'm actually going to, um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, kind of philanthropy's role in fundraising. And I think it's something that people maybe forget about. Um, but particularly for these mega events, I will say our budget for the college football playoff was about 13 million. Final four was fi uh, 15 million. I know the Super Bowl will be in the 35 to $50 million range. So you're talking about major expenses that a community has to put out there and you don't really get anything, right? I mean, the way that these mega events work for anyone who doesn't know is the community pays all the bills and the organizing entity, the NCAA Super Bowl, whoever it might be, keeps all the revenue. So that's how it works. And so you've got to find ways to come up with these, you know, $15 million, whatever it might be. And I think people forget that the philanthropic poll can be a really good way to introduce um, the giving to the community. And so one of the things we did with the final four is we had our read of the final four. We partnered with Helios Educational Foundation. They were kind of our original seed money for this project. And then we were able to grow it through that. But what it allowed us to do, it's not that, you know, their monies only went to our philanthropic efforts. Their monies also went to our operational spend. But we were able to get in the door because we talked about part of your money will go towards helping to build this, you know, facility if it might be or this read to the final four or whatever it might be and and i think maybe some people forget that companies particularly 501c i'm um, sorry corporations have both marketing dollars and community dollars that they can spend and so sometimes if you are able to say hey we we need some of your marketing dollars and that's going to promote your brand and give you an roi on whatever product it is that you make or sell or promote, but also you can use some of your philanthropic dollars towards this final four sponsorship, because you are also going to be helping us build this playground or do whatever it might be. So you actually have a way in that you can get them to be able to maybe spend a little more than they would just on a strict ROI. Here's what you get for your sponsorship. You know, here's the number of tickets. Here's the number of eyeballs. Maybe you get a little more of the feel good and you can tap into that philanthropic money that they would spend every year. And we did that for our mega events, but the Fiesta Bowl does that every year. That's part of their thing. They give away anywhere between two and $3 million a year. And so they're able to say to their sponsors, if you sponsor this event, part of your money is going back to the community. So it's a way to do some fundraising that isn't quite the same as maybe if you are the Diamondbacks or the Cardinals and you're a for-profit organization, um, the nonprofit part of this mega event world makes it a little bit easier to make that ask sometimes. Eileen, do you have any thoughts on that? I see we have- Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, with some of the, a lot of the writing and, and, um, and workshops we've been giving lately about this, are about this seismic shift in brand strategy and messaging and how 
you know, the, all the top sports spending brands, um, but really all the top 3000 fortune <laughs> companies, you know, are, are looking at activism engagement there, it's expected. Uh, and so they need to show impact from these sponsorships as well. They need to show that they want to go beyond the marketing dollars and they'll reach into HR budgets as well. You know, employee engagement around volunteering um, or whatever it, whatever it might be just, um, you know, and that can be at the employee's choice, but they often are looking for big company ways to do that as well. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely reach into a number of different budgets um, when you're doing that, but that's frankly, the, the philanthropic or, or community give of these events is no longer kind of a nice icing on the cake thing. It's integral. If it's not there, you know, the sponsors are less interested. They need to show that impact to consumers. They need to show it to their own employees who are calling them out on, hey, what are you doing? Uh, you know, how are you helping? Um, yeah, and you know, the other thing that's that's coming down the pike is is that even cities are being more selective about bidding. Um, uh, we see it a lot, unfortunately, with the Women's World Cup, we always see a lot of people that are excited and then they all kind of backpedal. But even with FIFA 2026, which is a, that's a big number and a lot of cities really wanna see that happen. Uh, you know, a few cities stepped back from it because they said, you know what, our first priority is taking care of our citizens. Um, we and, did, we and, step back from it, Phoenix did. Yeah. Yeah, so did Vancouver, so did Minneapolis, so did Chicago. They started asking questions about, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. We're carrying all these, these risks. We're carrying all the expenses. Um, you know, yes, we're sure we can make it back, generally speaking, but wait a minute. What are you really bringing us? And if it's just a party, again, or at the end of the day, all that deflated balloons and dirty confetti is left, then they, they're like, that's just one more thing for us to clean up. We don't need that. <laughs> so it's it's interesting times and I think it's positive times um, for this more holistic approach. And frankly, you know, even with our pro teams that we're working with, we're telling them your community relations department, you know, the people you used, you used to find pesky because they were asking for things like digital production or you know assets to give away to the community. That's now your revenue center. That's not your cost center anymore. That those, you know, those people should be your new best friends because they're the ones that make your your ability to amplify you, that make you an interesting platform for a brand, even if you're a professional team. And Ebony, you uh, put something in the chat that I think is just great that the PGA tour uh, donated a record it says $3 billion, which is more than the NFL, NBA, and NHL combined. And I think that is something great to point out that the, the traditional, you know, big pro leagues are a little slower to come there. They're getting there, but it has been the non, um, I, I major sports, I would say it has, you know, it hasn't been the NFL. It hasn't been major league baseball. It has been the golfs of the world. It has been, um, some of these other events that you don't necessarily think about. I think that's a great point to put out there. Um, I think the other ones are coming around to it, but even here in the Valley, the Fiesta bowl gives away more than the Cardinals, more than the diamondbacks, more than the suns every single year. And the only event that gives more to charity to, um, than the Fiesta bowl is, the, the waste, waste management, management. the PGA. <laughs> so I think that's true nationally, and I I see it here locally that that's an important thing for golf, and it's an important thing for the bowl industry. But maybe it's not so important yet, and it's getting there for some of the other um, professional leagues and teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, anecdotally, I, I think it's refreshing to see. Uh, you know, of course, the last six months has been, been crazy, but you're starting to see again the the importance of of uh not just talking but but doing and and um you know seeing a lot of brands the ones who putting themselves out there um getting involved even with the leagues you're looking at you know everything from uh, the black lives matter and the signage and um you know trying to get people to participate and, and activate and the more than a vote it's just uh you know just as a fan of of the big four sports and you know collegiate and all that it's refreshing to see that you know, they know how much impact um, they can have in our communities. Um, and that will, you know, and then it's interesting, it's telling, you know, the brands that are willing to put themselves out there with it, 
any other ones that are kind of being on the sidelines and uh, to, to probably their uh, disdain, the ones that are going to sit on the sidelines are going to be hurting because, you know, we're all going to remember, hey, you didn't stand up and you weren't a voice of, of uh, you know, trying to make this a better place. And, you know, it's just not for profit and revenue. It's, you know, what are we doing to become better people, right? And, and help each other out and lift each other up. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting time for sure. Yeah. And this information, so oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hey information's coming out in real time. Like I remember the morning of um, Blackout Tuesday, there was already this crowdsourced, it was a massive PowerPoint deck that was being put together by, I don't know, eight or 10 people and publicly out there of what brands were, what they were saying. It, it just kind of went down a laundry list of a whole bunch of consumer brands, some B2B brands. What are they saying? Uh, is it true? And what are they doing? And can we measure it? And and it was just in real time. This thing was being updated on Blackout Tuesday. So you could you could say, you know what? I want to know what those guys are doing. Oh, okay, they're doing something. Oh, wait, these guys said they're doing that, but now they're and, and a lot of it was employee activists who were kind of outing them, saying, yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> so, yeah. But really, there's nowhere to hide anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be doing so, business with purpose. I mean, you can look at NASCAR as an example with the Confederate flag and finally banning it. And, you know, they, you know, that they did a cost benefit analysis on what that was going to do for viewership, for sponsorships. And they realized this is the time we now have to do this. People expect it. And if you can even look at something, I don't know how many of you follow NASCAR, but Bubba Wallace is a driver and he just has signed with a new team that Michael Jordan is going to co-own with another driver named Denny Hamlin and they have done that partially because it matters to Michael Jordan right he wants to be involved um, he wants to own a team that has a, an African-American driver and he wants to be a minority owner in this sport but also they know how many sponsors are coming along with Bubba Wallace they are very aware of how much sponsorship dollars he will bring to this new team and they wouldn't have done that deal if he didn't have guaranteed dollars from companies that want to be associated with something that is for social justice. And so you can just see that as one small example um, of the power of you know fundraising and of corporate sponsorships now that is beyond just your, your traditional ROI, but it's got to matter. It's got to be philanthropic. It's got to be social. And so you've got to be thinking about that when you're doing your fundraising and your sales. Uh, and then kind of our last topic that we wanted to talk about that sort of grows into this and and Eileen has brought it up a couple times. Um, you've really got a plan now philanthropy if you are looking at a mega event and and I experienced this with both our men's final four and our women's final four bid women's final four was just awarded two weeks ago. We were asked very specifically what are your legacy plans what philanthropically will you do. We want this event to be something that is in Phoenix long past it. We want to grow the sport. We want to do philanthropy. What are you going to do? And we had to incorporate that into our presentation. And so Eileen and I have talked about, I think the word that she used, which I wanted to talk more about is intentional. You've got to have a plan for what your legacy will be in these events. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think it, we've seen all kinds of legacy plans and sometimes unfortunately they remain legacy plans and they never come to fruition um usually that comes out of a, a somebody at the early end going oh well we should do something for kids and we should do something for you know the disabled and we should do something and so they just start writing down a bunch of things um you know maybe without even going to in consultation with the local community where it's being hosted right they, they think about what they what they could or should do and and throw it out there and then try to make all those things. I think you know I, I think the best laid plan is going with some focus where it relates to what you do. If you're if you're FIFA, obviously you know it's a little bit about health and wellness and uh, you know you can you can make some ties to nutrition with that when it's sports, obviously um, maybe schools. But then you you start with that local community and say, what do you need? What do you want? to have happen after this has come and gone, if it's something massive like that. Um, you know, and, and that's really, that's something that should be happening on, on every city economic planning side as well. I mean, what is the intent of, of us hosting this event? But, you know, from the rights holder side, what can you realistically go in there and do? And then ideally, what could you repeat? But I think the biggest step, whatever it is that you decide on, 
I think the litmus test is to look 10 years down the road. If 10 years after we've come and gone, will somebody be able to point to something that we left behind that was positive? Um, you know, it might be infrastructure like a light rail um, system and that's not to be um, uh, dismissed at all because that's, that's pretty important for getting your people around this city to, to work. Um, but, you know, it, it can be other things like, you know, with, with Toronto, um, and their, their diversity supplier, and then our Women's World Cup diversity supplier, that opened up a number of cities to rethinking their procurement practices. They weren't doing that because it's, it's not as advanced in Canada supplier diversity as it is in the US. So, and those programs that they were kind of thinking about, they were able to pilot through the event and then see, wow, this is working really, really well. We should have done this years ago, but now you've got a legacy program going on that's that's going to be there. Well, if we're here 100 years from now, it'll be there 100 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's certainly been a gift that's going to give year on year and that can be counted and, and, and actually pointed to um, in terms of both, you know, financial returns, but then the, the um, ripple effect of social returns, additional jobs, more less volatility in the local business community, all those things. Yeah. And, and Rich, I'm just interested in think about kind of your role and, and this new technology role and planned out philanthropy, because I think it's just going to be something that as people are deciding on legacy projects, this opens up a whole new world for them. Yeah, I think it's, uh, again, sustainability. One is, is how do we maximize uh, the time, the space uh, when we're here? And then how do we continue that uh, in an easy way? Um, and then how do we leverage the money spent uh, moving forward to track that, measure it, um, personalize uh, the attendee fan experience, whether that's in, in location or, or outside of it. Um, and yeah, excited to see, you know, the, the, again, the versatility of what this can do um, and how it can optimize, um, you know, these mega events and uh, provide, you know, that much more value and, and opportunity for infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah, I could, again, I could see a mega event where you, you make the emphasis, let's enable all of our local retailers to bring in NFC payments, something that might be for those individual businesses really tricky, you know, the timing and the cash flow. But if, you know, the city embraces it and says, look, you know, we're talking about a group purchase of, you know, the right um, payment terminal machines and all that good stuff. And you know, group employee training about how to use them and what, you know, troubleshooting and, uh, you know, I, I mean, boom, you've, you've made your city that much more future friendly and, and you've helped your merchants along in their, in their day to day too. Yeah. Last thought on that, which is amazing because of the Apple ecosystem is literally imagine uh, in these cities where, you know, they're not open all night, but they have window, window shopping actually takes on new meaning because literally you can have an NFC enabled sign or sticker mm -hmm. integrated with Apple pay and you see a nice blouse or whatever hat on the, on the, uh, in the window, you go tap it with your phone and it's uh, actually paid and shipped to you uh, right then and there in, you know, three or four seconds and you're not even open. Um, so the ability to, um, you know, le leverage that, uh, again, even in that little retail example, that's just one little nugget of, of opportunity that, um, again, can create value for that, uh, you know, localization, if you will, of money spent by, you know, attendees and fans. Uh, it's interesting. A lot, lot of uh, enablement opportunities, right, with the technology, for sure. Absolutely. Well, I think we are almost out of time. I don't know if we had any other questions. I didn't see any in the chat, but I didn't know if anyone had any last questions for us. <laughs> Bueller. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did that yesterday. Yeah. Oh, good. See, I knew we'd get along. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, then I think um, we kind of have, I think I've had a fun time on this panel and I hope everyone that's been listening to us has had a good time. Yeah, round of applause for you and your moderating. Yeah, yeah. thank you for leading us through it. Thank Stephanie. you guys for being awesome panelists, and and I hope everybody learned something. Great. Yeah. So now I want to go and get one of those bracelets. Figure out more about that. Yes. <laughs> Text me, oh. Skype me, Instagram me. Yes. Great. Yeah. yeah. Put my contact info in the chat at the top as well. But uh... yeah, I couldn't. I didn't put mine in, but you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm I'm there. So <laughs> yes. Okay. 
Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. everyone. Bye. Bye.